general science and engineering talk, and so um, I'm not sure that I really need to spend a lot of time uh, developing your wireless intuition. Um, so wireless intuition, then linear algebra framework for uh, designing codes for uh, wireless systems with uh, multiple transmit receive antenna. Um, I'll talk some about orthogonal designs, and then we'll switch subjects and talk some about quantum computing. Then we'll bring the two subjects together at the end. So the idea here is that we'll we'll explore a subject and then we'll come back and do another subject. So if you find yourself getting lost, you should just hang in because there's going to be an opportunity to re-enter the talk later. And um, what I, one of the things that, um, that I hope you'll come out of the talk with is uh, you'll be able to come out of the talk and design your own quantum error correcting codes. So, that's so um, wild situation. Okay, so this is the. Uh, this is the, the, the wireless picture. Really, the purpose of this, the, this slide is to explain to people who do coding theory in the binary world, where you know zeros get changed to ones and ones that get changed to zeros, that there is a more interesting space for them to work. Okay. So, point of this slide is that wireless channels are more complicated. There's a richer set of impairments. Um, Yet the, uh, the tools that we have are just the same. The only tools that we have are memory, so state, and redundancy. Uh, but the point is that when you, um, you know, in coding, you're in this game where you have some kind of baseline system. You invest a certain amount of power. You get a certain error probability. Uh, you do coding. You get really clever. So instead of power P, power p prime to get the same error probability. You take the ratio of p to p prime, express that in dB, and that's a coding game. And if you're you know, working in the uh, Reed-Solomon code area for read channels, and you get really clever and you double the number of code words, that's probably worth about a tenth of a dB. Right? But wireless channels coding signal processing is worth like 5 to 10 dB if you get really lucky. So on a rock logarithmic scale, that's much more significant. So this is a more interesting place to work. Uh, here, I'm just trying to capture what makes it more interesting. Local fading, uh, uh, reflections that mean that instead of a single train, you get two trains superimposed, one with a delay, and you have to sort, sort out the superposition. You have other folks that are trying to use your channel, and uh, when you drive away in the car, um, the channel changes. So it's just a much more interesting place to work. Now, what are we going to be talking about? So, um, so what we what we're doing here is we're doing an experiment where. Um, you're over here at the base station and you're taking the transmit antenna and you're moving it up and down. 
And the experiment is that you're standing over here um, with, with the mobile and you're keeping track of the signal strength. And so you get variation in, in space and also in time. And so this is a picture of what it's like in Kansas, where in Kansas everybody is line of sight to the base station. And uh, there's very little variation in, in space as you move the antenna up and down. And so the only thing you have available as a coding theorist is introduced redundancy in time. This, however, is uh, New Jersey, which is much more interesting. So you're moving the antenna up and down. And you get a richer variation in, in space. And so now, instead of having one antenna that you're going to move up and down, think of having two antennas that are spaced far enough apart to generate independent paths from the, uh, the transmit antenna to the mobile. So the, the way that you, you, you think about this is that the, um, the, the channel has a statistical characterization. Uh, you're thinking about transmitting data in frames. Um, you're going to think about the, uh, the channel for a frame as being constant and then the channel changing from frame to frame. So it's kind of a quasi-static model. So the way that you think about it is every time you transmit a frame of data, you get a realization of the channel. Two independent paths, two independent realizations. And space-time coding, which is what I'm going to be talking about, you, you, um, you, you, get, um, you get to take advantage of both time and space. So we have these two antennas, and we are going to correlate the signals that we send from those antennas. So we're going to correlate you know, top antenna, bottom antenna, so we have correlation in space, and also correlation in time. So in a sense, when we think about code words, code word is going to be an array. Antennas go down, time goes across. And, uh, And this is what we call at at and an executive view graph, <laughs> right? Because this is because the, the message to the executives is actually embedded in the slide. You know, we are here and we could be there. And this is it's kind of an old slide. It was from when uh, the folk at at and Wireless were were primarily concerned with these um, uh, brain dead, uh, well, not really, I mean, so they made a certain choice. They were concerned with narrow band TDMA channels, 30 kilohertz channels. Now they're more concerned with GSM channels, 200 kilohertz. Uh, so here, um, if you want to think about these throughput numbers with respect to uh, GSM, you just multiply them by six. Uh, what we've done here is that this, this, this is throughput. It's measured in terms of outage capacity. And so the idea here, so if you have 3% outage capacity, then 97% of the time you send a frame, you get that data right. So 3% outage is a good curve to draw for real-time services like voice. So this is, this is a 3% outage curve. And um, what we've done here is we've, 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 we've drawn outage capacity uh, for different antenna situations. So the different antenna situations is we have one or two antennas at the transmitter and of the mobile. So this is the baseline, one transmit, one receive, and what's theoretically possible. This is two transmit, two receive. This is one transmit, two receive, and this is two transmit, one receive. So first thing you observe is that um, uh, if you have a choice, it's better to put the extra antenna at the receiver. Now, why is that? 
that's because um, at the transmitter you're fair about totally radiated about total radiated power. So if you have two antennas and you're radiating the same power, each one is going to be at half the original power. And that's why these curves are 3 dB away from each other. So. Now, so why are you interested in this curve at all? And, um, and the deal here is that, in a sense, it's harder to engineer two antennas into one of these guys. It's not impossible because there are clever things you can do with like polarization. Um, but the main thing is that it's a, it's another channel that you've got to implement in RF. And that's going to cost more. And so if you're Ericsson, you're thinking, oh, now if I do this, then my phone is going to be sitting on the shelf next to the Nokia phone and mine's going to cost $15 more. And then I'm going to be dependent on the guy at Radio Shack to explain to the customer the benefits of received diversity. Uh, not going to happen. <laughs> but, so it's one of these things where in a sense the whole industry has to move and think it may move. Um, but the the uh, the reason for for, um, for 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 telling that story is just to say that it's difficult to get multiple antennas at mobile devices, and part of the difficulty is technical, and part of it is economic. So it's much easier to put an extra antenna at the base station, and um, we. Uh, when AT&T Wireless was, uh, was part of AT&T, we spent a lot of time flying to Scandinavia and trying to push um, uh, multiple antennas into, um, in particular, the GSM Edge standard. And Edge seems to be really taking off these days. Lots of people are short of money. And lots of people are happy that they didn't win the auctions. Right. So. But the, the the discussions with the uh, uh, Nokia and, um, and and Ericsson, um, there were some there were some ground rules for the uh, for the discussions. Um, and the and the ground rules were something like this: that um, if you if you ever talked about more than two antennas, they throw you out the room, right? And if you ever talked about coding in a way that didn't wasn't in the context of an end-to-end -end view, where you worried about channel estimation and the complexity of equalization and then you got thrown out of the room. And if you propose signal processing which caused them to go out of the current generation of GSM DSPs, then you got thrown out of the room. And as long as you lived inside of those rules, you could stay in the room, right? Um, so that's, again, that's just a, um, uh, just gives you an impression of, of what the, commercial forces are that are providing friction for innovation. So, and that's why we look at small numbers of antennas. Because the people that we were talking to who are actually in charge of making stuff won't make lots of antennas. Okay? Um, so, so that's the reason for, for focusing on here. And actually, why is it interesting? Well, what's What's, what difference does it make? If you think about wideband CDMA, the difference between the two antenna mode in wideband CDMA and the single antenna mode is some of the difference between 100 kilobits and 384. And the reason is that high rate services require short spreading sequences and short spreading sequences don't have the reliability without the extra antenna. 
something else which I don't know that this actually happened, but it was something that uh, Sinula thought very, very hard about. I don't think that they actually did it, but they, they, they got to a fairly advanced stage of planning. Was um, voice services. Okay, so right now you're doing, let's say, full rate speech coding. Okay? And it's kind of a hog of resources, and you feel that you could go to half rate speech coding and have twice as many people. But you don't have the cha your channels won't support half rate speech coding. But they would if you had an extra transmit antenna. So you could build out an extra transmit antenna, get a better channel, go to half rate speech coding, take on twice as many people in the same resource life would be good, make more money. Okay, so that's, those are the sort of things that you can do with even a small number of, um, of that. Okay. So that gives you um, some motivation for you know, kind of what you can do with multiple antennas and why transmit diversity is an interesting thing to do. So now you've all had your intuition developed. We will do linear algebra, which is every undergraduate knows is, is really the secret to, to, to everything in the world. And so here, this is the model. So this is what happens to a, a frame of data. We have code words, just think of these as complex numbers. You have this channel matrix, so you've got a matrix of complex path gains. Um, You'd like to be able to lift this up and lift the bottom of the slide up. So what we're doing is what you receive at the end of the channel is you code word, path matrix gets applied, and then there's Gaussian noise down here gets added. So from a linear algebra point of view, what you're trying to do is choose code words so that different code words are far apart at the output of this channel. <coughs> Is there any time or, or no, sorry. Um, <coughs> so these were transmit antennas, and these are receive antennas. So this thing is characterizes the channel from transmit antenna two to receive antenna one. Okay. And like I said, code words are arrays. We're interested in the difference between code words that's coded up in this matrix B here. <coughs> and you're interested, because it's Gaussian noise, you're interested in the square distance of the output of the channel. And you just kind of write it out, and you take a deep breath, and you rearrange it, and you come out with this. So here, this is sum over receive antennas. There's a matrix A in the middle the difference between these two code words C and C hat. And the difference, this matrix is just B, B star, where B was this matrix that coded up the difference between the two code words. Right? So that's where the that's where the difference between the code words enters. These guys, so J here is a receive antenna. And this is a vector of complex numbers, which gives you the path gains from the different transmit antennas to that receive antenna. Right. So think about these as vectors on some complex sphere, and they're wandering about from frame to frame. And now think about the bad things that can happen. Right. So this matrix might be singular. So it might have a null space. And the, the vector might hit the null space. When it hits the null space, that becomes zero, right? Then your call drops. Can so, you, yeah. Can you show again the definition of A matrix? Sure. So A is B, B star, uh -huh. and this was B. Okay. Okay. So now you can say, ah, I know how to design codes. What you need to do is, for any pair of code words, this needs to be as non-singular as it can possibly be, so high enough rank. 
And for a given rank, I want it to magnify distances. So I want the non-zero eigenvalues to be big, so that this distance gets magnified. And there's a, there's, a, there's a channel model, and you follow it through. And, um, and uh, this is the, the expression for the probability of error, which allows you to pick out a diversity gain, which is kind of a degrees of freedom thing, which is associated with the rank of that matrix A, and a coding gain, which is associated with the eigenvalues, the non-zero eigenvalues of that matrix A. So there were R non-zero eigenvalues corresponding to the rank R. M is the number of receive antennas. This is the baseline SNR. So you see there's a power that, that's involved with the, the rank of that matrix. And then there's this. So that gives you an idea of, uh, and that's just saying again what I said in words. And um, so that's the linear algebra. And now I want to show you a, um, a space-time code. And um, the, the message in this part of the talk is that um, there was a famous Irish mathematician called uh, the mathematician this is called Hamilton who invented quaternions and Hamilton was really sure that quaternions were the answer to every single problem in the world no matter what problem you had quaternions were the answer <laughs> and the point of this talk the point of this part of the talk is that Hamilton was right okay. so here is the space time code uh, Time is going across, antennas are going down. So you have two time slots. First time slot, you send C1 from the first antenna, C2 from the second. Second time slot, minus C2 bar from the first, uh, C1 conjugate from the second. Okay. And um, yeah, so I want to, so here, I want to just take you through what happens at the receiver, um, because you know, when you're a coding theorist, when coding is what you do, you know that there are engineers in the world who don't like codes. And we think that they're you know, short-sighted, et cetera, et cetera. But we have to recognize that there are people like that, and they don't like codes because it, it robs them of throughput, et cetera, et cetera. And space-time codes are really codes for people who don't like coding theory because it's just signal processing. And so here, first time slot, you send C1 and C2, gets multiplied by the two path gains, noise gets added. Oh, here I use star instead of con to, to denote conjugate. But this is what you see at time interval two. And if you take the complex conjugate of this, then you can write the received vector in matrix form like this. And you can see that the important observation is that whatever the value of the path gains H1 and H2, this is an orthogonal unitary matrix. Okay, well, well, pardon me. Yeah, and yes, that you're thinking about two transmit, one receiver. Correct. That's right. So these are the two time slots. Um, and um, so this is a this is an orthogonal matrix. Now, the way that you should think of communication happening is that there's all sorts of pilot tones and stuff going on. So these things are actually known at the mobile. Right? So at the mobile, you can actually apply H star, and what pops out is a scalar multiple of the original code word plus new noise. But the deal with new noise is that new noise is old noise to which a unitary matrix was applied. It started life as Gaussian. It's still Gaussian because of the unitary matrix. So here you can make component-wise decisions. And you don't have to sort the, the complexity of joint control. So that's, 
So the key thing, though, is this um, is this orthogonality. And um, and so when you abstract that mathematically, you find yourself interested in um, in in uh, in these mathematical structures. Um, at some point in my life, I will figure out how to get PowerPoint and and projection perfectly lined up. But clearly, that point has not arrived yet. Um, but anyway, orthogonal designs. It does, don't worry about it. It's, it's, it'll be fine. So the matrices X and the the entries of the matrix X. I think that doesn't change it. it doesn't help it. Yeah, no, it doesn't. I, I mean, I could I could move this. <laughs> but so orthogonal designs. The matrices where the entries are indeterminate. You should think of the indeterminates as being what you're going to use to send information. And the orthogonality, which is important, is that you take xx transpose, this is in the real world, you get a scalar multiple of the identity. And you already know examples of such things, because you know the complex numbers. And you can think of complex numbers as 2 by 2 matrices over the reals. So you multiply, so if you do that, if you think of x0 plus ix1 is this matrix. The rule for multiplying together complex numbers is just the rule for multiplying together matrices. Okay. So you actually already, even though you perhaps didn't know, you actually were familiar with this. So now we did the complex numbers. The next thing we do, of course, is the quaternions. So this is quaternions. So here, we have these little matrices that tell you where i, where the variables corresponding to i, j, and k actually appear. And then Hamilton did something really interesting. Okay, so he said, okay, I can think of quaternions as real numbers, but I can also think of them as pairs of complex numbers. And when I do that, this is the rule for multiplying together two of my complex quaternions. And you stare at that a little bit. You say, well, if I took this pair of complex numbers and I represented it as this matrix, then that rule for multiplying together complex quaternions would just be matrix multiplication. So now, Keep this matrix in your mind while studying. Quick, quick thing: overscore is the same as complex contribution. Yes. Yes. So keep that keep that two by two matrix down there in your mind, and I scroll back to here. It's basically the same matrix. Okay. So this little two by two space time block code is actually goes back to Hamilton, and Hamilton would be enormously proud and think it enormously appropriate that perhaps, you know, 500 million cell phones, there'll be a little quaternion code. Now, next slide, you know, just says, so now we're, we're interested in complex numbers, not real numbers. Um, so we're interested in complex um, indeterminates. Well, how do we sort that? We just take a complex matrix, break it into its real and imaginary parts, ask what it means to be orthogonal. Uh, you get this, and you say, well, I deduce from that that the X part and the Y part each have to be an orthogonal design, and the pair has to behave nicely with respect to each other. And that's that condition there y x transpose has to equal x y transpose. So complex designs. And the next slide. Oh, excuse me. Yeah. Uh, y should be the equal y the commutator of these two matrices uh, if it's proportional to unit matrix. It will still satisfy your condition of your unitary design. Just if the uh, proportionality coefficient would not be a real one. It would be some complex. Yes. Yeah, so that would be. You think it would you. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure about it. I haven't thought about that, actually. That's an interesting question. Because there is a whole uh, uh, 
algebra is called Heisenberg algebra where you have two operators and they commute mm -hmm. something proportional to a unit matrix. Yeah, and we'll we'll actually see that in a minute. So oh, so you will so, that. So but your question there don't know whether that's possible or not. Mm -hmm. the the about sort of question. Uh, the axes are structured in a particular way. There's something about having uh, they can't have any old entries, they have to have plus minus a particular constant. No, they can be, I mean, in this, yeah, actually the definition of an orthogonal design is just the entries are indeterminates. So however you specialize that indeterminate, so whatever constellation you use, it will still work. Yeah, and I'm missing the uh, difficulty in the design. It's easy to find orthogonal matrices. Uh, with indeterminates? I don't know. Yeah, so that, yeah, so the, so with indeterminates, it's, it's, it's it's more complicated. So here's a, an example of four by four. So here, this matrix down here has three complex indeterminates. So it's four by four. It has three complex indeterminates. So the um, challenge would be, you know, could you do it with four? Right. Answer is you can't, but, and that this is best possible, but we'll see that at the very end. Um, what we're doing here is we're, we're actually at the frontier of number theory in 1900. So all number theory gets, gets applied eventually. Right? It just takes a while. So. so above quaternions, there are things called octonions, which are portables of complex numbers rather than pairs of complex numbers. This is the rule for multiplying them together. And uh, what you do here is you stare at this for a bit and you say in each of these lines there are some AI bars and some AIs. And every time I see an AI bar, like here, or there, it's opposite of B3. So if B3 was 0, then I'd only see AIs, which means that I could represent multiplication by that octonian with B3 equals 0 as a matrix. This is the matrix. Okay. Because it's an algebra, because things have inverses, uh, this thing is, a, is an orthogonal design. Um, and uh, so this is a, a, a an interesting example. Okay. And so now, so so in a sense, what I've done here is uh, told you told you about these guys. And if you actually, yeah, I have a question. Like in this orthogonal design, if I use the same, if I want to put it on a channel. So horizontally is the time and down are antennas. Correct. So I see that at each instance of time, one antenna is not transmitted. That's right. So there is a duty cycle. Why in the 2x2 two two case, the duty was that the duty cycle was 100% of the time. That's right. So the question <coughs> is, um, so there, there are all sorts of questions. So, I mean, all sorts of questions. So, clearly, it's better to use all the antennas all the time because then you get to transmit more data. Um, there's um, one of the things, actually, let me, let me make a, um, a few comments about, um, about, about this. So these are these matrices are quite special. I mean, they correspond to quaternions, which means, and you can look at them and you can say, ah, if I add two matrices that look like this, I get another one that looks like that. If I multiply two of them together, I get another one that looks like that. If I actually ever had to take the inverse of one of these matrices, I get something that looks like that. So from a signal processing point of view, there's closure properties here that are really nice. And one of the things that we, um, that, that we spend time doing at, um, uh, when we were working on this was we were interested in four transmit 
to receive. Where the four transmit were actually two separate two transmit one receive systems working together. Okay. So what what in a sense you're doing? Instead of it instead of imagining um, you, you're just sort of gluing two of these things together, and then at the receiver, what you're going to do is interference cancellation to uh, to decode the streams that are coming at you. The algebra of the signal processing of interference cancellation is hugely tied up in the fact that these are quaternions. It's really, really pretty, and it works really nice. Well, the reason that we were interested in this was we wanted to start with the GSM channel, and we wanted to prove that with four transmit to receive, we could send um, a megabit uh, between half and a megabit. So in a sense, what we were trying to do was go to people and say, wasn't it lucky that you lost the, the auction for wideband CDMA spectrum? Because if you just invested in signal processing, you could actually put together the same services as the wideband CDMA guys, but you wouldn't have to carry the debt load. Right? So you match them on services, they have to service their debt, they go out of business, you take their customers. So that was the that was the crude proposition. Maybe it will work at some point. Now let's talk a little bit about now these orthogonal designs, as, as you actually recognize, what we're gonna end up doing is we're gonna have bunches of matrices and we're going to be interested and we're going to they're going to have being an orthogonal design is is going to be about whether these things commute or anti-commute and building big collections of the same and um, and uh, that turns out to be connected to quantum computing I'll actually explain why so 15 minutes on the so this is probably the only picture that you can take of Los Alamos these days. And um, this is uh, Manny Knill and uh, Raymond LeFleur, um who built a quantum computer at Los Alamos based on NMR. This is from New York Times. And the reason for having this slide is right. 50 years ago we had, we were starting out in regular computing, Today we're starting out in quantum computing. Well, 50 years ago, a regular computer was just a big physics experiment. I mean, you've seen these pictures of ENIAC. It's basically a big room full of stuff, right? And that's what quantum computers are today. And uh, don't know whether the next 50 years of quantum computing will be as spectacular as the last 50 years of uh, regular computing. In a sense, what we need is something that enables the quantum computing model, but which is stable from a physical point of view. If building the quantum computer means that I have to manipulate simultaneously the state of a thousand beryllium atoms, well, we're not going to build one of those guys. NMR is stable. The only problem with NMR is that it only gives you about 20 qubits, which is not enough to do anything real. But the fact that it exists means that there that other examples perhaps could be found. And so physicists are looking on it to find them. So let me tell you mathematically the model uh, that I'm going to use here for quantum um, uh, stuff. So think about a system where there are two base states. And in the classical world you're either in one or the other, so it's just described by a single bit. In the quantum world, you're actually in a little two-dimensional Hilbert space. Um, you can think of the basis elements for the Hilbert space as the two pure states, and you're in some linear superposition of those two. And um, when you make the measurement with respect to that basis, you collapse to one or the other, with a probability which depends on the coefficients that you work. 
And so if you have n of these two state systems, then you're operating in a two to the n dimensional Hilbert space. You've got basis states which are ind indexed by the binary entiples, and you're in some superposition. Now, let me explain to you, uh, wave my hands, about Peter Shaw's factoring algorithm. So what Peter Shaw did was he showed that if you could build a quantum computer, then you could factor in quadratic time, whereas the best algorithm for factoring is sort of close to exponential. That's a really big deal. and generated a huge amount of interest from the three-letter government agencies. How does it work? Okay, what he does. So think of the number that you want to factor as being around 2 to the n for some n. And think about these base states as being the potential factors, like all the numbers up to you know, 2 to the n, right? So what Peter does is he loads his Hilbert space with a uniform superposition of the potential factors. So he starts off with a state where these things are all the same, right? And then he has an algorithm that runs on the Hilbert space. Basically, he keeps applying unitary matrices to it. And as he applies the matrices to it, what happens is that the coefficients of the non-factors go to zero, and the coefficients of the factors don't. So that when you make a measurement, you discover a factor with high probability. So that's how it works. I'm waving a lot of hands. Now, the only problem with this is that you're over here in this Hilbert space doing your calculation. And the thing is that the rest of the world is trying to break up your calculation. So the space that you're in interacts with the environment. In a sense, the environment introduces errors into the calculation that you're trying to do. And so, question is, could you do error correction in this, in this world? So the thing that makes regular computing possible is that you can build reliable computers out of unreliable components. Could you do that in the quantum world? And um, before uh, Peter and I about this. People thought, well, maybe you couldn't, right? Because there's this thing called the Heisenberg uncertainty principle that says that you can't make a copy of a quantum state. So you say, oh, I know what coding is. Coding is like repetition. So instead of sending a one, I send one, one, one. Well, Heisenberg says you can't build one, one, one. Uh, doesn't mean to say that you can't do coding. It just means that you have to be a little bit more clever. But let me tell you. So I'll give you what I'm going to do is I'm going to hide behind this principle, which is one that, um, so I'm going to hide behind the uh, work by physicists, which says that if I can build a quantum error correcting code that works with respect to this discrete model, then I'm okay. All right, so I'm going to tell you what the discrete model is. So if we just think about these two state memory cells, so two-dimensional Hilbert spaces. These are the sort of errors that come in. So the two-dimensional Hilbert space is a qubit. This, think about the rows and columns as being indexed by the two states, zero and one. This is a bit flip. This is a phase. So the errors are you can have one of these, or one of these, or a bit flip and a phase flip, which is multiplication of the two. So this is, these are, uh, these are power matrices, little two by two power matrices. I'm sorry, Rob. Yeah, just go back one more. And the principle, let me make sure you understand, you're saying the principle at the bottom yes. says that if you can correct those errors on one individual or, or any linear combination of those two errors on an individual qubit, you can also correct multiple errors and multiple qubits? No. What it says is that the physical world is more complicated. 
and I have abstracted a discrete error model. What this says is that it's okay to work with the discrete error model. Okay, so what I'm going to be doing is on this slide here, I'm, I'm looking at two to the n-dimensional Hilbert space and I have errors that come in and change the state of my calculation. What do those errors look like? Well, they have this discrete form, and that's okay. So the errors that come in are tensor products of little 2 by 2 matrices, where each 2 by 2 matrix is a little Pauli matrix, one of these guys. Okay. And so what I was asserting before is that if I can figure out how to do error correction with respect to these errors, I'm okay in the physical world. Okay. And what I'm going to, so now what we're going to do is I'm going to tell you that you actually already know how to do, I'll give you an analog from binary coding theory, which is, which is very much aligned with what we do in the quantum world. So, um, and it's called syndrome decoding. And you know, in binary coding theory, you have these things called parity check codes, parity check matrices. Let's call it H. And so the definition of a parity check matrix is that something's a code word. So C is in the code if and only if H of C is zero. So C terms are So so the the um, so something's a code word if it's orthogonal to every row of the parity check matrix. Okay. So now what happens? in communication is that you send C and errors happen to C. So instead of C, you get C plus E. Now then, let's think about what happens here. Well, you know HC is zero, so this is just HE. So this thing here is a syndrome. And here you started inside the code, and the error took you to some coset of the code, and the syndrome tells you which coset, okay? Doesn't tell you anything about which vector you are, okay? And so, how do you do error correction? Well, for each coset that you could land in, there's a most probable way of getting there, which is that way of getting there that involved the fewest number of errors. Right? So a means of error correction is figure out which set, figure out which coset you landed in and then go backwards using the most probable way of getting there then if no more than that number of errors happen, you have a way of correcting for those errors. Right? So, let me abstract what's going on here. You have a code. You go to a coset. You make some measurement that tells you which coset you went to, but gives you no information about which vector you were in the coset. There's a most probable way to have gotten there, and if you reverse that most probable way, you have a means of correcting errors. Right? Now, I, you, I can tell you what a quantum error correcting code is. What you do, so this is a group, and it's actually a really, it's a really cool group. Um, it's got um, four to the n group elements in it, Everything in the group um, can be represented by a pair of binary strings of length n. The A string tells you where the x's are. So these are the little x's here. So 
there's an X in the second and the third spot, so that's why it's 1-1. One, one. This tells you about the Z's, so here there's Z's in spot 4, 2, and 1. So that's here. Okay? Now, everything in this, 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 this error group here, they're, they're matrices. They're 2 to the n by 2 to the n matrices. And they either commute or they anti-commute, which is either AB equals BA or AB equals minus BA. And there's an easy way to tell. So if you're interested in two things and you want to know whether they commute or not, write out their strings. So you have an A and a B and an A prime and a B prime. And you just take the inner product A primed B, on two of course, plus A, B prime. If that comes out zero, they commute. If it comes out one, they anti-commute. So now, what's important in quantum mechanics is commutative subgroups of this guy. And it's easy to build a commutative subgroup. You just, you just write down a bunch of binary strings. You want any pair of them to be orthogonal with respect to this funny, or funny inner product that I just described. And so here what I've done is I've written down a commutative subgroup with size 16. So this is 16 matrices, each of which is 32 by 32. Um, we're going to be interested in eigenspaces. Right, so 32 divided by 16 is 2. There are 16 different eigenspaces. Each is two-dimensional. So there's a two-dimensional space which is fixed by every one of these guys. That's what it is. And this is a quantum error correcting code. So the way that quantum error correcting codes work is this is the error group. Build a commutative subgroup. A quantum error correcting code is just an just an eigenspace. You can choose the fixed eigenspace of that of that uh, that commutative subgroup. And here's where I'll wave my hands a lot. So you've got the quantum error correcting code. When an error comes in, anyone from this discrete set of errors, what it does is it moves it to another eigenspace for the same group. There's an analog of syndrome decoding, where you make a measurement and you figure out which eigenspace it actually was. So what is and then there's a the most probable way of getting to the new eigenspace. And if you can reverse that, then you can correct that error. So this is actually a single error correcting code, one qubit into five qubits. And the measurement had nothing to do with what so was there already at the point. That's right. It had no, you see, yeah, if you ever got any information about the vector, then you'd lose the superposition. So you've got to You've got to do this syndrome decoding here in a way that doesn't leak any information about the vector. So that's really the key. That's the key point. So I'm sorry, I'm yeah. a little unclear. When you do the measurement of the syndrome, yeah. that of course puts the state of the system into an eigen uh, state of that measurement. Right. So it collapses onto that coset, right? But it doesn't affect the vector that you were. I see. So, so you, yes, you have collapsed. So you are now in a particular other eigenspace, or a particular coset. But C of what was there, C times what was there was zero. Yes, so exactly. So, yeah, you, have lo you haven't lost useful information. That's the key thing. Now, okay, so what you, what you take away, so this is the common mathematical foundation. There's this interesting algebra here. And, it allow, and because of this rule here, it allows you to build big, connect, big collections of matrices that either commute or anti-commute or do various things. And now we can go back to uh, the wireless world and we can say, ah, real orthogonal design, what does it mean? Well, let's just pick out 
use the matrix AI to pick out everywhere the variable XI appears. And then let's write down what it means to be an orthogonal design. Well, it means that these matrices AI have a certain relationship with one another. This is what it is. So you look at that and you say, ah, I'm nearly there. If I just change the basis, this is what pops out. So I get matrices that are either squared of the identity or squared of minus the identity, and they have a certain commutativity property. You say, oh, I know how to build these guys. I just work inside them. This, uh, this, um, you know, this, 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 so this is the frontier of number theory in 1922. Um, but you can actually build, and there's, a, there's an upper bound, and there's a constructive lower bound, and the constructive lower bound uses this group of matrices. And then you can say, complex? Well, this is more complicated, but it's not any harder. So you just write down what does it mean to be a complex orthogonal design. It's all of this lot. And you say, going to change basis again. You get these things out. Again, you get matrices that square to either minus the identity or the identity. They do something inside each family. And across family, they're in a certain relationship with one another. So this this, this, uh, this set of matrices gives you a way of producing orthogonal designs. It's actually the reason why um, Ericsson and Nokia have been taking on physicists. Because you can actually work backwards from their standard submissions to interesting sets of Pauli matrices. Right? So, uh, <laughs> And actually, well, that's but when, you, when you look at four by four complex designs, you can ask how many variables can you support? And so here, uh, we've break, broken it into real and complex. And um, the number of variables is the sum of this plus that. And you see that three plus three is the biggest number that you can get. So that's six real variables, three complex variables. That's the rate three quarters code that we uh, that we uh, that we showed here. So um, there's so there's all sorts of places that you can take this. Uh, you can start. You can ask questions about. Suppose you don't have complete orthogonality. Um, you can also ask questions about broadcasting in wireless, where some variables might have more degrees of freedom than the other, or higher diversity gain than the others. Um, there's a um, there's something that's really cool in terms of um, of, of this picture here, which is you pick one commutative subgroup and one eigenspace, right? That gives you a quantum error correction code. Well, take an interesting collection of subgroups <coughs> and take all their eigenspaces, right? So that gives you a bunch of different subspaces sitting in, you know, all possible subspace space. And what happens is that there's a very rich group theoretic structure here. And these subspaces are actually very, if you choose your collection of groups properly, they're very regularly distributed. They're a little bit like the, the multidimensional analog of CDMA sequences. So in a sense, when you have one antenna, you have a CDMA sequence. When you have multiple antennas, you're looking for a higher dimensional subspace. But you'll end up looking for some analog of correlation between subspaces. Well, there is such an analog, and this is a good way of building them. So here, you know, you're, you're, you're thinking about transmitting information by your choice of subspace rather than by the vector in a particular subspace. And that's an interesting area. So, a little bit. 
three minutes over time. That's the end of the talk. Go for kill. Questions? Always going to be fantastic. Okay, so it's good that you're not asking me about the physical part because uh, uh, I'm a little, little shaky on that myself. But, um, so there is a physical measurement that identifies the eigenspace you've got into, right? And you could just have a list of eigenspaces and errors associated with them, which are the most probable way to have gotten that. So this is an end thing. What you're trying to, what I thought you were trying to do here was at some intermediate stage. That's right. So you're gonna so in a sense you have a computation. You let it run for a certain period of time. You make one of these subspace measurements. If necessary, you bring the computation back to the space that it started and let it keep running. And so now it's a matter of choosing that time interval, right? So that no more than so many errors happened. So it's it's a fault tolerant quantum computation. And so you know, what you're saying is basically the quantity measure you throw away those things that you know yeah. that's in that point. <laughs> right. It's kind of a cool thing. And so, having said the cool thing, let me say the uncool thing, which is um, there's a um, there's a little bit of a gap right now. So I described fault tolerant quantum computation, and and the theorem I think right now the best that people can do is that if the error rate on the physical device is let's say, I think it's between 10 to the minus 3 and 10 to the minus 4, then you can do fault tolerant quantum computation. Right? But I think that the errors on the physical device are around 10 to the minus 1, 10 to the minus 2. All right, so in a sense we're improving anything, yeah, because those haven't lined up. I guess one other thing, uh, maybe I finally got you in determinant business. What you're doing is you're designing these things, the indeterminates of the states uh, that you don't want to look at essentially if, that you uh, do not the same the vectors that you don't want to actually measure ahead of time. Yes. And you structure the code so that it essentially ignores those and this is the same problem. Yeah, it's it's actually so let me um, um sort of grossly exaggerate um, actually the so I don't know if you if any of you know experimental physicists. Okay. All right. So experimental physicists tend to have a fairly low opinion of mathematical physicists, right? They think that they exist down here on the food chain. But because one remark and why is it worse? <laughs> and vice versa. It's yeah. very neutral, especially <laughs> in the new <laughs> of recent events in Bell Yeah. Well, so the the um, you know the, the point of view of experimental physicists is that mathematical physicists they they write a 150-page paper starting from certain assumptions, and the punchline is that there's a phase transition in this temperature interval. Well, every experimental physicist knows that there's a phase transition in that temperature interval because there's always been one, right? And so, in a sense, they feel that the mathematical physicists did not tell them anything they didn't know. And one of the things that was remarkable for me to witness was the fact that they thought of Peter Shaw in a different way. Because I think that what Peter demonstrated to them was that they did not understand entanglement. And, um, and, and, um, and so, um, you know, there was, I mean, there was, a, there was a, a, an amount of appreciation there that I had never seen. Uh, between these, in a sense, that's all make Peter an honorary mathematical physicist. But, but that was quite that was quite remarkable um, uh, to me. And um, 
And yeah, I think I, I really think that that's that's, that's true. And um, and of course, you know, experimental physicists have benefited a great deal from the infusion of, uh, of money into this. I mean, this kind of foundations of quantum mechanics used to be a place where slightly disreputable senior physicists went to retire. Because there was kind of some flaky business. <laughs> and it's become a part of the mainstream, I think. Yeah. A question, since we already have moving towards the physics. So what exactly is the physical realization? I mean, what, how the thing will look like, what they're using? Photons, schemes, whatever. Is the realization of this uh, Hilbert space so that this device really works? Well, there I'm getting into uh, more. Uh, so my 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 background here is one where I read articles in Scientific American and I read them as a lay person. So it's um, polarization of photons is one example. Um, I think the more that I talk about examples, the deeper in trouble I'm going to get. But there's, I think that the important thing is that, they, that, that it's, in some sense, it's not important that it be a quantum system. What is important is that it afford quantum superposition. So, I mean, this model... You know, this model here, where you can, where you can, in a sense, load all possible configurations and operate on them all at the same way, at the same time. That's the important thing. Uh, I have a related question. Um, you mentioned before that uh, in Heisenberg principle um, sort of prevents from replicating the quantum state. Mm -hmm. But if you talk about, let's say, photons, there are known devices which do exactly that. For example, laser. So you can generate, if it's a photon, mm -hmm. you can generate actually coherent states of them. You just have how many particles in absolutely identical states. Sometimes it's being reports like both Einstein condensate. Yeah, so there, <coughs> so there are things like belt states that you can actually build, yeah. right? Um, what this is saying is that you couldn't take a bell state and then make a copy of the same bell state. You it couldn't prove because actually I think it is possible. I'm not sure. Anyway, that's it. Uh, let's do that one again. <laughs> <laughs> Say that again. Well, the thing is, uh, Rob, ma Rob mentioned that the big problem, no, there should be yeah, redund the redundancy. Yeah. That's a great helper in any other example. Now, in physics, it's uh, unclear whether if you have a state, you can just create a second replica. So you can send the same state. Wait, that's okay. The example, example which does it, for example, simple states, it's laser. So laser just sends a few beams of photons which are identical. The next photon is identical to the previous one. It's a coherent state of photons. The question is whether it's a real a superposition of states, whether it is possible to really make the copies which maintain all superposition properties, which is certainly uh, open. Let so, me ask the question differently. I take two entangled photons, one going this way, one going that way. Yeah. An experiment doesn't make. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I put two optical amplifiers like those um, uh, laser diode pumped uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, rare earth fibers. Yes. Uh, one photon goes in at this end, one photon goes in, I get 10 and 10 photons. Are those additional nine photons entangled? Or what do I get? How are those? Well, there is even an uh, old outstanding, even with two photons, there is old outstanding paradox which has not been uh, uh, the uh, resolved to the uh, satisfaction of people. It's called the uh, Podolsky or the Einstein experiment, and you do exactly that, and then you measure one of the photons, and then from quantum mechanics, due to the conservation laws, you can pretty much say what will be the polarization of another. Right. But if you allow to say that, it will mean that your information propagates faster than light. Yeah, I mean, right. you just no, no, but it is, actually it's, it's open stuff. No, but that, that actually has been resulting that you don't have real information that travels yeah, faster than light. Well, I'm asking uh, something actually <coughs> more mundane. I have two photons that are entangled. I pass them through two optical amplifiers. 
Oh, it's I get it's ten, uh, 10 photons. Are the additional nine, the quote additional nine photons, are they all entangled? What's the relationship between these between two and the additional nine? nine? I mean, are they created in pairs? You can answer that question without knowing something about the bias of yeah. the relative states. Oh, you want to put that right? Because you, I'm asking, because you kind of set up something where you said you have these two amplifiers. Do you know if they're... See, my view, my view of the optical amplifier, forget the photons that don't exist anyway, but the underlying electromagnetic field, which is the same as the quantum wave function, essentially, uh, gets simply amplified. Uh, background noise, I mean, the, quant the uh, zero point field gets amplified along with the uh, actual field. Uh, so I, I don't know, but I know that I'm very close to getting into serious trouble. So I <laughs>